Bizarre Brain Comics. Pickles. <laughs> Gilbert. Beetle Bailey. Hard wood. That's the home production. Mm. Mm. You're here. Are you supposed to be here? Well, I guess so. About that time. If, if you're here, you're probably here for comics, aren't you? Yes. So, instead of reading some comics, let's talk a little bit about some comics. Not just comics, either, but... I know most of you out there aren't old enough to, to remember the 1970s because most of you weren't born then. But for those of us who were, you might remember Saturday morning cartoons. Shows about, some of the shows, they had dinosaurs and cavemen. Shows like Land of the Lost and Valley of the Dinosaurs. There's another one. No dinosaurs, but cavemen. And that was called Korg, 70,000 BC. That was a live action show. Hmm. Just like Land of the Lost, except it didn't have as much special effects and it was more realistic. Now, I'll tell you about that. Because the comic book we're going to be talking about tonight is this one right here. Hanna-Barbera's Korg, 70,000 B.C., number one, 1975, I think it was, 1976. Korg, 70,000 B.C., from 1976, uh, correction, written and drawn by Pat Boyette. Let me tell you a little bit about Korg here. Hmm. See, as I said, it, uh, it was Hanna-Barbera's Korg 70,000 BC. Remember, and you might probably know Hanna-Barbera best for, for cartoons like uh, the Flintstones. Yeah, the Flintstones. Flintstones, the Jetsons, uh, Top Cat, uh, even Scooby-Doo. Some great stuff. I love them. And it was a live-action series, which uh, consisted of 16 episodes produced uh, from, from 1974 and 75 for ABC. And this was a dramatic adventure series, as opposed to all, most of the other uh, um, stuff that they produced, which was uh, humor or humor adventure. And it was an, intended to be uh, educationally based featuring the highest archaeological research of the time. I mean, so that, of course, by now we know more about prehistoric times than, than we did 50 years ago. But it, it was pretty good for, for the time. I've, I've watched, I remember seeing a few episodes. I enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and it was created by Fred Freiberger, who was also one of the producers for Star Trek and Space 1999. And the series was about a family of Neanderthals surviving in Ice Age Europe, hence the name 70,000 BC. That was before modern humans made their way up into, uh, into Europe and Asia, as far as we know. And the comic book, as I said, was written, it was a, a licensed property, was written and drawn by Pat Bayette, and that lasted for nine issues. And about Pat Boyette, he was born Aaron P. Pat Boyette, uh, from 1923 to 2000. 
And he started as a radio actor on a local soap opera as a, as a youngster. Then he became a broadcast journalist. And he, serving, he served in World War II as a cryptographer. And eventually he became a TV news anchor in San Antonio, Texas, which is where he was from, and a producer of a daytime talk show. He even wrote and directed a low-budget horror movie in 1962 called The Dungeon of Harrow, and a science fiction comedy called The Weird One. While working on TV, he wrote and drew a Western comic strip, Captain Flame. I've never heard of it before. And for, it was for a newspaper syndicate. And after leaving broadcasting in the 60s, he worked as an artist and writer for Charlton Comics for about two decades. He co-created with, with Go, uh, Joe Gill. <laughs> That's funny, I started to say Go, go Chill. Uh, with Joe Gill, the character of the Peacemaker. He's a non-superpowered superhero which is uh, now owned by DC Comics and not, not very used very often. He wrote and drew stories for a variety of titles, uh, Ghost Manor, uh, The Min Many Ghosts of Dr. Graves, and other similar horror titles, as well as uh, science fiction and west westerns. I remember seeing a lot of his stuff in science fiction and westerns from, from Charlton. And he even did licensed properties like Korg, like Flash Gordon and The Phantom and Jungle Jim, as well as others. He even even uh, uh, did some work for the licensed um, Space 99 Space 1999 comic. And uh, his work continued to be reprinted by Charlton through the 19 through 1986. And afterward, he continued to do some work for independent pu independent publishers and even some for, for DC Comics. Yeah. Korg, 70,000 BC. Korg was the, uh, the father, had his brother Bach, his wife and two children, I think, was the, was the family unit. I can't remember their names. So, <coughs> let's get down to being cavemen. <coughs> I know, cavemen isn't correct. They were Neanderthals. Korg, 70,000 B.C. Woo. Yeah. It's a caveman. We, what we call it colloquial, colloquial... I'm showing you the wrong cover. Anyway, this is number one. With the ma uh, honey, a mammoth hut on the front. And I was showing you number seven. That's number seven. Those are the only two issues that I've got that I know of. And uh, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, number one. So this would have been 1975. Yeah, 1975. Well, the number seven was 1976. Now, one thing that is we see is different. Because normally, Charlton Comics had just a, a line drawing and a four color process uh, color for on the cover. But you notice here in both of these, they were full paintings done by Pat Boyette. Actually, not bad for paintings. I have had seen very few of his paintings. Uh, most of these covers, and I think a couple others. And uh, I also have this other book done by him from years later. From this is one of the independents that he had done back in the in the eighties, I believe. But I have it here so I can show this other on the back cover. Of that is an advertisement for another comic for this from this company. When the painting is by Pat Boyette. And it's, it's not bad. Not bad at all. Okay. Page one. Here we go. Script and art by Pat Boyette. Now, Pat Boyette was... Uh, you can clearly see the Neanderthals are prominent brow ridge. 
broad nose. Probably not broad enough, really. <clears throat> but he made him look like the actors portraying them. Because remember, this was a live-action program. And they could probably do things in the uh, in the comic that just simply would have been too expensive uh, for a Saturday morning children's program. <clears throat> and here I have Korg sitting, uh, standing here, waiting. And he's long into the chilling dusk and says, the wait will not be shorter in the house, in the, <laughs> shorter in the cold, when there is food and fire inside. Yes, Mara. This is Korg. This is Korg. And this is his wife, Mara. And he's waiting for his brother, Bach, to return. They'd gone on a hunt. And he just, he can't help but worrying about his, his brother. He hasn't come back. And then we cut to Bach while he's out hunting. And this, this, here we give the title of the story, The Snow People. And he's attacked by a bear. Not, uh, apparently not seriously injured, but he loses his spear. Now one thing you can see here, well, I'll show it later. I'll show it later. He's attacked by the bear and he takes off running. And he falls off off of a, uh, a precipice and lands in the snow. So he's not only slightly injured. <clears throat> now this is some, some decent, pretty good storytelling here. You can see the bear, Bach, his feet slip, him falling. And it's, it's a nice layout. And then it's just like one nice arc coming down to where you see Bach landing in the snow. Now... I wanted to tell you a little bit about his art. Now, when I was a kid, I d did not like Pat Boyette's art. <clears throat> At least not very well. And I still have some some reservations. But I don't begrudge him anything. Uh, because if you can look closely, you can see his, his style was a little bit kind of like Joe Kubert on the organic side. Uh, a little bit. But he looks like he used a, a, a pen on his inking here, which is fine, but not quite as rough as, as some of uh, Joe Kubert's stuff was. <clears throat> and he has a, a good, you can see all through here, good command of the, of the anatomy. He has good storytelling. It's just his style just is not all that appealing. It's perfectly fine, and I'm not say anything bad about him he had good storytelling and here we see Bach in the snow we see someone someone's approaching we see someone carrying a stone-headed axe but the first thing they say is slave no Bach I am Bach so they he takes off running they catch him drag him off make him to, to enslave him well, to Bach that must have been someone must have been uh, something just beyond the, the concept of forcing someone to do work for you. Well, here we're back at uh, Korg, and he's worried. He gets some stuff together. He tells his son he's got to stay home and watch over the family because Bach, I'm a correction, Korg is going looking for his brother. And he follows the trail. He gets into the snowy area, which would, which would be around the, uh, up on the glacier probably. He's following his trail, and he finds box broken spear shaft. But what creature could have broken it so? Korg knows that some mighty beast is lurking in the frozen night, and he must be on guard. He builds himself a fire there because it's nighttime. And now the bear attacks him, and Korg has to defend himself. He wounds the bear wounds the bear with a spear, but in the process he loses his spear. I see the storytelling visual storytelling is is fine. It's pretty good. But you might notice also that it's not 
as dynamic, which may very well be why he was working for Charlton and not for Marvel or DC at the time. Because um, his, his draft, draftsmanship is perfectly fine, but and his storytelling is fine. I have no problems with any of that. It, it's just not as dynamic. His work just is not as dynamic as as was, but those are mostly superheroes. But even as when we covered Joe Kubert and, and Viking Prince, you could see how nice and dynamic everything was. And here he is the next day. He's during the stays up during the night making himself a new spear, which you don't see too much here. You can just see him has a, a stone and he's he's uh, um. Cutting down and and finishing a spear shaft in in front of the fire. Of course, it doesn't show him in much detail. But then you can see that here is down here. He's free, freezing up to his knees in the snow. But you get a really good look at his spear shaft. He did not have they these people did not at least in the story did not use uh, stone spearheads. But they obviously used stone tools because he used a chopper right there. And what he what they would have done is sharpened that stone, uh, correction, sharpened that that shaft and then hardened it in the flame to make a very serviceable spear or lance. So here's all he thinks he's being followed by the bear. So he's trapping through there, and then he notices he's being followed by the bear. So he's on the run, trying to get away from the bear again. But no, I must find Bach. He says, he thinks how easy it would be to close his eyes and rest. But he, kn but he knows that to sleep here would be fatal. There he is in the snow. And we're back with Bach, and they're just working, the, working him to death. Meantime, an aching back and a tough taskmaster has given Bach a true meaning of the word slave. Thinks he's not moving, going quickly enough. Wraps him in, on the head, knocks him around. Because these guys, these guys are bigger and tougher, and they outnumber him. But they're still making him work. So it gives him some, but they do give him some meat to eat. Said more raw meat, more raw meat. So they must not know too much about about fire, or at least not about cooking. So he builds a fire here, and he cooks the meat. He says, I will not eat raw meat again. Ha <laughs> ha! Slave eat burn meat. He makes him taste, taste. Oh, it's good. He likes it. He's got, now look at that face, that expression. It's a good, good expression. Boy, this guy's got a lantern jaw, doesn't he? Quite a big jaw. He has some in, interesting uh, um, page layouts. Here, which you didn't see a whole lot, especially for some of the alter the uh, alternative uh, um, publishers. You teach women how to burn meat, so yeah. So he shows them how to how to cook meat because they like it. But meanwhile, he's planning to get away. He's uh, squirreling away some food so he can has a chance to get away. And Korg is still hunting for him. The bear kid is still right on his tail. And suddenly Korg realizes how serious the situation has become as he looks across the endless white shroud and knows he is lost. Then here we see Woolly Ones come. Here's the, the other tribe. This is a really nice figure here in this whole panel. This is uh, some nice, nice, nicely done here. All of it. You can't make out what the Woolly Ones are that much here, but you know, they're Woolly, woolly Mammoths. Here they are running. Some, some decent mammoths. I think their uh, tusks are a little too curly on the end. So they said, "Come, slave, we need your strong back." And they go to hide because they they hunt the woolly mammoths. Said, "Woolly ones come to kill us." Go why? Because we have no sacrifice to give them until now. So they decide they're going to sacrifice Bach. But you notice here, like, their spear shafts, they have. Stone points. An upgrade in technology, even though they didn't know how to cook meat. We know, we know now that they would have had to know how to cook meat because cooked meat is part of what helped us become 
big brained apes. So here they go. They kick him out into the into the snow for the mammoths. And here's Korg still trying to get there. And the mammoths are attacking because they're all they're they just don't like the sight of humans because humans hunt them. They were probably just on a migration and happened to come across the the, the tribe. Bok, it is Bok. Korg, Korg spots him. And he goes to help. Mammoth takes uh, Bok up in his in his trunk and flings him. Fortunately, it's a soft, fairly soft landing in the snow. See, even here, you can see, storytelling is perfectly adequate. Here he's, Korg is thrusting his spear, but can't penetrate. His wooden shaft can't penetrate the mammoth hide. Now, when a spear shaft, uh, as a, a stone-headed spear, probably would have. They don't mention any of this stuff, but that's kind of implied in, in the story. And then Korg gets knocked down and is about ready to tramp, get, get trampled by the mammoth when the bear shows up. Bear. And so the bear and the mammoth go to it. And then meanwhile, Korg and Bach escape and they get away and they head for home. Because although battered and bruised, the two brothers happily begin the long journey home for they know what a war that a warm cave and warm smiles are waiting. The end. And then they have a, a page here, of, a text page, uh, The Birth of Man, which is just about, uh, I don't know, about human evolution, and has a little backup, two-page backup things drawn by somebody else who I don't I have no idea who is. Perlin Alasia, I think is how, how that would be pronounced, just about the CR, probably. It's just a two-page filler. And then here, you can see his same work. And he's got a nice double page spread in the center. Same kind of work. Perfectly adequate. I've, grow, I've grown to enjoy his work as I grew older. And, that was him. and then his is probably the most, the, the most recent thing I've, I've ever seen done by him that I know of. And this is 1986, so it might have, I think I have seen something a little later. This is called uh, Red Robin and the, the Lutins by Pat Boyette, and they call it a fairy tale. Is it? Probably is. Look at this, this uh, uh, introductory page. Nice little framing there with all these little characters. And, stuff. and I actually really like his work in here. Um, it's more more stylized, more cartoonish, slightly more cartoonish, and uh, I think a little more polished. You can see how cartoonish that thing is. This is a much more complex panel than probably would have seen before. I don't know. It's it's kind of nice. It's, most of his more realistic characters still have the same kind of looks, but he has a little um, added a little cartoonishness to it. And it, uh, because it is a fairy tale, and the whole thing is, is I, to my eye anyway, uh, more appealing than his older stuff. And I don't, and I, and I don't misconstrue me into saying that Pat Boyette was a bad artist. He's not. I think he he, he did a perfectly fine job again on this these cover paintings. Perfectly fine job. Good storytelling. Good. Uh, uh, use of, an, of anatomy and the like and this this page is actually re relatively dynamic but it's still kind of static uh, when you compare that to the kind most of the kind of covers and interior art you, you would have seen for at the same time at Marvel or DC but his work has kind of grown on me over the years and I would like to, really would like to see some more of his independent stuff from the from the 80s and 90s. Oh well. That's Pat Boyette. That's Korg. Some nice nice panel as I showed you. Nice storytelling. Nice panel layout. Just it kind of different. Most most of them, I think, even in this 
Yeah, he continued that. He did that in the uh, in the Phantom and uh, Flash Gordon. And I and I do enjoy his work. It's just not as flashy. It's pretty workmanlike. It's still slick, still professional, and kind of organic. And that's all I've got about Korg and Pat Boyette. So, thank you for joining me. Please, please sh share, like, subscribe. But remember, comics are art.